this is just the beginning. Hello and welcome to an Axios virtual event, COVID-19 testing in a post-vaccine world. I'm Sam Baker, I'm the healthcare editor at Axios coming to you from Washington, DC. I'd like to take a minute to thank Siemens Health and Ears for making this conversation possible. And I'd like to welcome our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course, Axios.com. Uh, if you are following along on Twitter, please follow along using the hashtag Axios events uh, and by following at Axios. Over the next 45 minutes, I will be joined by my colleague, Axios future correspondent, Brian Walsh, to unpack the future of COVID-19 testing as vaccines continue to roll out. Our first guest for that conversation today is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, an associate professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, a senior fellow for global health on the Council of Foreign Relations, and a familiar name to Axios readers, Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, who's joining us from Baltimore. Dr. Nuzzo, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. I am noticing in my uh, life and reporting, as I'm sure you are in your life and work, that whenever you try to talk to anyone or a lot of people about any sort of non-vaccine intervention, social distancing, testing, all of the things that we had to do when there was no vaccine, a lot of people just don't want to hear it. We've got a vaccine. This is almost over. Uh, Walk us through for folks who might, you know, it's a tempting mindset, um, but just sort of walk us through why we why we still have to, why these other interventions still matter. Yes, it is a tempting mindset. I think a year into this, more than a year into this pandemic, everybody is just ready for it to be over and, and just to move on. Um, we're getting closer, but unfortunately, we're not there yet. And while vaccines are incredibly important and really the path, they're going to pave the path to normalcy for us, um, the the reality is the vast majority of us are still not protected from this virus um, by uh, having been vaccinated. And so um, that is all the more reason why all of the uh, measures that we have been using for the last year uh, remain essential. So testing is a really critical intervention. It's the way that we find people who are infected. It's the first step in the process that helps us uh, interrupt transmission of this virus. Getting diagnosed with infection helps you know that you should stay home and not spread the virus um, to others. Um, but testing is also important for us to just understand what's going on. It's, it's the basis of our surveillance. It's how we figure out where in the country the virus is and where it isn't and what people it's, it's circulating and what people it might be sparing. It helps us keep track of trends. And, and crucially, it is the first step in trying to discover if perhaps there is something changing about the virus and perhaps. Um, acquiring traits that we don't want it to have. There's been a lot of press about the um, genetic variants and, you know, really testing is the foundation of our surveillance that ultimately leads to the sequencing that tells us if genetic variants are in our midst and if they are um, gaining uh, traits that we don't want, like enhanced transmissibility, severity, or even, you know, the worst case scenario, the ability to escape our vaccines and medicines. To what extent do you say, I mean, obviously it's a little bit of both, but is this sort of a, a macro need for testing to keep an eye on variants and sort of know uh, where the virus is versus the sort of micro need, you know, we need to test individuals in a certain setting like we've seen with athletic bubbles or maybe we could apply something similar to schools, you know, is it, is it about the big picture or, or keeping individuals safe and how do those two intersect? It's very much both. I mean, we need it at the local level, just first of all, to figure out who's infected and who's not, and to know that those people need to stay home until they're they're not contagious. Um, that's that's critically important. But it's also needed at the larger level to help us understand the trends about this virus. I mean, you know, we saw um, different uh, trends emerging throughout different points of this epidemic. You know, over the summer there was was a you know helpful decline, and you know everybody sort of anticipated that the fall would see a rise in in, in cases, and that very much happened, unfortunately. Um, and now, um, you know, we have the potential to see another rise in cases as um, states are, in my view, prematurely uh, relaxing some um, public health measures like mask mandates um, and other things. And so, 
um, because the vast majority of us are not protected um, from this virus, um, from vaccine or, or natural immunity, uh, you know, we, we need to continue to, to look for infections and to make sure that it doesn't spread and outpace our efforts to vaccinate. So really testing informs our understanding of what's going on at all levels from the, the personal, knowing that, you know, today is not the day to go and visit you know, my my vulnerable relatives because I'm infected um, to to the national trying to understand are is the situation in the U.S. getting better? Is it worse? Are we headed into yet another, um, you know, surge in cases or, um, you know, are we kind of simmering until the, the vaccine um, can be rolled out even more broadly? As vaccinations, you know, c continue to to increase and to ramp up, uh, a lot of people are sort of thinking through kind of the details of, well, you know, this is almost over. Well, but what is over? Or we could get back to normal. Well, what, you know, obviously that's going to be a little bit subjective. It's going to be a moving target. It'll be something that happens gradually. What, what do you think uh, over looks like? Like what is sort of the realistic place that we might be in? So my hope for um, the U.S., I'll, I'll focus on the U.S. because um, we are fortunate to have um, a lot of access to vaccines. My hope is that um, we can continue to keep our public health measures up so that we can protect people long enough so that they can get vaccinated. And that through the use of vaccine, we will basically defang the virus, tame it to the point where it is not capable of causing severe illness or death. That is a really crucial goal in my view because it's really what separates this virus from, you know, all the other coronaviruses that no one had ever heard about. Um, it's our worry that people could get quite ill with it. So it, using the vaccine um, to achieve that, I think, is a remarkable um, uh, goal in and of itself. And I anticipate that as we continue to roll out the vaccine, we will also um, ultimately see a, a falling of cases because we know that the vaccine can also reduce transmission. So if we continue um, to keep people safe until they're able to get vaccinated. And that means adhering to some of the um, public health recommendations like crucially mask use, um, but also you know, not prematurely opening high risk venues um, that maybe um, uh, lead themselves to outbreaks. Um, for you know, the next few months, I think by you know, summertime, and certainly I'm hoping that fall will look a lot more normal because that we will have lower levels of infections, much more manageable levels of infections, and we will no longer fear um, the, you know, devastating hospitalizations and, and deaths as we've seen over the past year. And I know you've been a little bit skeptical in, in the past uh, about sort of this, the idea of having a, a vaccine passport or an immunity passport um, that will, you know, allow you to get on a plane or go to a restaurant or, or, or whatever that is. Um, and I think a lot of those kinds of businesses, particularly bigger institutional businesses, uh, are kind of looking at testing as an alternative to, you know, some sort of proof of vaccination concept. Yes. I mean, testing is um, an important way for us to establish, you know, is it, let me just say, testing is an important part of an overall um, approach to controlling the virus. It's not um, an end by itself. It, um, it's, it's how we diagnose infection, and then it has to lead to some action. People have to stay home, or in the case of businesses, they're excluded from attending the business. Um, it is not a perfect indication of that because test results can be wrong, but I think it can provide important information for who's at you know highest risk of being there or not. Um, but it has to be done in conjunction with other safety measures like um, you know continuing to wear masks and, and distance and, and, and other other um, other measures. Um, but testing is really important. I think all of these things are additive. And I think sometimes we get into these sort of debates, um, you know, which is more important, vaccines? Is it masks? Is it testing? Is it distance? Um, it's all of it. And each of them are imperfect, but added together, they make up for a fairly safe circumstances. So um, we need it all. On the topic of vaccine passports, you know, it's, um, I think, really tempting to say, okay, let's identify the people who, who are now safe. And by, for sure, vaccines, um, do improve people's safety and it does give them more freedom to do things. Uh, my worry is that um, pursuing vaccine passports is sort of the wrong answer to the question, how do we get back to normal? The answer to the question of how we get back to normal is that we really end the pandemic in the sense of no longer worrying about its devastating tolls. And we're not gonna get there until all countries um, are able to access vaccines. And unfortunately, I think passports are kind of a, a shortcut that take our, our eyes off um, the ball of 
you know, needing to make sure that all countries have access. And we won't be in a good situation if we just exacerbate the disparities that already exist in terms of vaccine access by then compounding it with um, travel penalties that only those with access can travel and engage in trade and those without can't. Do we have the the kind of tests we need? Obviously, the the U.S.'s ability to do testing has increased dramatically over the course of this. But are those the right tests in the right place at the right cost to do sort of this this next phase of testing that we're going to need to do? No, we need more testing. Uh, we need more of the laboratory-based testing that we're doing now because that is still um, the kind of you know spinal cord of our response, our laboratory, you know, our our surveillance response. We need more sequencing, but we also need more rapid tests. We need rapid tests that are um, ubiquitous that we can, you know, use in, in lots of different places and at a at a volume that will enable repeat testing. And we also need them to be much more um, inexpensive than they are right now. Um, some of the cheapest rapid tests are about five dollars each, which is extraordinarily low cost in the scheme of things, and particularly compared to laboratory testing. But um, there are 15 million public school children in the U.S., and so um, even if you were to test all of them once, uh, that would be a prohibitive cost. So we really need to make them much more, um, less, uh, you know, less expensive and uh, much more widely available. All right. Oh, well, I think we've got to leave it there. We're, we're out of time. But uh, Dr. Nezzo, thank you so much again for taking the time to be with us today. It's always great to speak with you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And up next, we have a View from the Top segment with Axios co-founder and CEO, Jim Bandahat. Uh, thanks very much, Sam. Uh, it's now my pleasure to bring you a conversation from Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin, uh, my homeland of Wisconsin, with the president of Siemens Health and Ears Laboratory Diagnostics, Dr. Deepak Nath. Dr. Nath, thank you for joining us. Jim, it's a pleasure to be with you. Before we get going, why don't you explain to uh, viewers what Siemens Health and Ears is and what you do specifically? Siemens Health and Ears is a leading uh, diagnostic company. Uh, we've got the largest uh, installed base of instruments uh, in the United States, uh, and I lead our uh, laboratory diagnostics business globally. You spend a lot of time thinking about the virus, thinking about its patterns, thinking about the future uh, uh, of the virus and, 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 and testing. How should we, the viewer, think about uh, testing, especially as we move from this phase of lockdown to something that, that, that starts to resemble normal? Uh, there's two broad categories of tests, Jim. One is uh, tests for active infections, and they come in different flavors. One is PCR tests that we've all heard about. And then increasingly, there's point of care rapid antigen tests where you get a result uh, you know, within 15 minutes. And there's a new category of that test, which is laboratory-based antigen tests, where you're able to test for active infections with large groups of people in a relatively short uh, period of time. And then the second broad category of test is to measure the body's immune response, and that's often referred to as serological testing, um, where you're trying to get an assessment of how well uh, the body has mounted an immune response uh, to uh, either natural infection or natural exposure to the virus or uh, post-vaccination. Can you talk a little bit about the partnership that Siemens Health and Ears has with the CDC uh, when it comes to testing and why it matters to us? Sure. We uh, played a pioneering role uh, in establishing a collaboration with the CDC and the Joint Research Council based in Europe. And the central question here is, as uh, vaccines start to uh, take hold and more and more people get vaccinated, the question we're trying to answer is how effective are these vaccines, both at an individual level and at a population level? And in order to answer that, a key tool is a test to measure the concentration of antibodies in blood. And in order to do that, what we've established with the CDC uh, is a mechanism to compare concentration of antibodies across different test manufacturers. So a person can go to a laboratory and regardless of which manufacturer's tests the laboratory uses, they can run a comparison. The second with the CDC, we've tried to establish a threshold for immunity. In other words, at what concentration of antibodies does a person uh, have immunity? 
So those are two very important questions we forced this collaboration with the CDC back in July, and we're awaiting results from, from those scientific experiments that we're con conducting jointly with the CDC. And if I want to be a super helpful citizen and I want to do everything I can when it comes to testing, as we move into this next phase, what type of testing should I get done? And if I want to do some of the more elaborate testing that you talked about that would help have sort of comparative sets of data, how do I do that? Uh, the first is active infection. Um, you know, keep in mind, Jim, that 25% of the population is not yet eligible for uh, for vaccines. In other words, kids, right? It's not until closer to the end of the year when we hope that uh, kids will be eligible to become vaccinated. In that environment, the uh, it's can be important to continue to test for active infections, either through PCR or laboratory antigen or point of care antigen tests. So that, as a patient, we should continue to seek. Uh, at some frequency. The second is post-vaccination. Uh, it would be good for us as, an in, as individuals to get an understanding of, of how much uh, uh, antibody concentration is in our blood. And our recommendation is to do that three weeks post uh, the second dose of vaccination of vaccine. So you get a baseline and then repeat that test somewhere between nine and 12 months uh, to get an understanding of whether um, there's sufficient level of antibodies that are still present uh, in an individual's or a patient's blood. And where would I do that test? Like at a CVS, with my doctor, with semen and Like Where does that take place? Uh, the, the tests are run in a laboratory. Uh, so you can get an order for that test from your doctor. Uh, or in some cases, you can actually go to a patient service center for one of the reference laboratories like Quest or LabCorp and ask for that test. Uh, you're a doctor with way more expertise on these topics uh, than most of us. As you reflect on the last year and, and just from a medical perspective and you've seen a vaccine reach scale quicker than I think anyone thought possible uh, a year ago, what are the lessons that you take away that you think will be applied to the healthcare system going forward? Great. I mean, just to set the record straight, Jim, I'm not a medical doctor. My PhD is in theoretical mechanics. Uh, but to answer your question, I think what this pandemic has done is shed a light on the importance uh, of, of, of technology, of science and technology, and bringing forward the kind of tools to help stem uh, the tide of this pandemic and, and actually help uh, alleviate uh, patient suffering. And I think as we look toward the future, there's important lessons that uh, we've taken away from this pandemic the importance of testing technologies and the need to further develop those technologies. And of course, on the therapeutic side, the continued need um, uh, to develop therapeutics in response to uh, you know, particular types of pathogens. So there are important lessons that uh, we've learned from this pandemic that I believe uh, will stand us in good stead uh, when we face uh, a, a challenge like this um, again in the future. You're in Wisconsin. I'm a uh, stone's throw from Washington, D.C. I can see the Capitol uh, from the window uh, over here. What can Washington do in this next phase uh, to better help uh, the testing process and making sure that we learn everything that we can as quickly as possible so that we make smart decisions? Uh, the continued um, uh, the recognition of the importance of testing uh, to fund uh, various entities to not only test for active infection, uh, but also for surveillance uh, to understand the effectiveness of vaccines at an individual and population level remains an important imperative that uh, I, I would uh, I would recommend to uh, to our public health uh, figures. And secondly, to use data that are generated from these tests to make uh, smart choices and decisions uh, that impact uh, populations. Uh, so those are two. Uh, recommendations that I would have uh, to policy officials in D.C. Uh, Dr. Nath, we appreciate uh, you. We appreciate this conversation. We appreciate uh, Siemens Health and Ears for making this broader, uh, important discussion uh, possible. And I look forward to returning to my homeland of Wisconsin next week for the first time in a year. Thanks for having me, Jim, and safe travels to you. Thank you very much. And over to you, Brian. I'm Brian Walsh, future correspondent at Axios. I'm coming to you from Brooklyn, New York. Our next guest is Assistant Professor of Epidemiology at Harvard's Chan School of Public Health, and Associate Medical Director of Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dr. Michael Mena, joining us from Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Mena, hello. Hi, thanks for having me here. 
You've been pushing for you know widely expanded at home rapid COVID tests really from the early stages of the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about that vision and how it differs from the way we've actually used testing over about the last year? Absolutely. The the pre-COVID testing has largely been a medical diagnostic tool. Uh, it's prescription uh, and it is to use to diagnose people. But in the midst of a pandemic, we can switch the purpose of testing from just purely a diagnostic test to actually a test that is going to help mitigate spread at the community level. This would be through empowering people to know their status essentially in real time and give them enough information about whether or not they are infectious so that they can uh, know for themselves whether they need to isolate and quarantine or if family members do, for example. But the only way to make that a, a reality is to get the tests uh, away from being prescription use only, make them smaller, simpler, and tests that people could be using at home. These tests exist today. They're like the, they're, they are in the same format as a pregnancy test. If you have one line, you're negative. If you have two lines, you're positive. Only uh, in this case, you're just doing a swab on yourself, uh, putting it into a small little tube and, and putting a, essentially a little piece of paper in there as an indicator. These could be available and, and scaled so that most households in America have a box of them. Uh, but we, are, we have run into some regulatory hurdles that has largely prevented it. Yeah, tell me more about those regulatory hurdles, because as you know, these tests exist. Um, they're being used, and I know in other countries, at least in trials. So why don't we have them for us here in the United States? Yeah, sure. Not just in trials, actually. In, in many places in Europe, they're being used, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of them. People can go out and buy them uh, at grocery stores. They can get them delivered. Some governments are supplying them to all members of their, uh, all citizens of their country. So these are, the U.S. is sort of lagging behind here in its ability to get these out. The reason is because uh, our regulation is centered around medical diagnostics. We actually, we've so undervalued and unfunded public health for so long that we don't actually have a regulatory mechanism to authorize a test that is going to be uh, evaluated as a public health tool first and foremost and a diagnostic tool second. Uh, in this case, all regulation, the FDA's real mandate is to uh, authorize tests as, as medical diagnostic tools. And so when we get down that road, all of a sudden these tools need to meet, uh, uh, need to meet standards that you'd expect for a, a million dollar instrument in a hospital lab, not a one dollar paper strip test. But in a hospital lab, the testing is going to be infrequent, expensive, and these are going to be the type of laboratory based tests we've seen throughout this pandemic not the kind of simple at home, very frequent, simple to use tests that this pandemic really uh, is requiring if we're going to use testing as a means to mitigate spread. We all obviously already lost the last year when it comes to being able to use this kind of test. Going forward, you know, we have vaccinations being rolled out. Those numbers are rising every day. We have a long way to go. But how do you see this kind of testing potentially working with vaccinations that will hopefully be covering a large percentage of the population? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's one I get a lot. Um, certainly, I started speaking about this almost a year ago now. Had we had these rolled out, it's a fair question. Had, had we had them rolled out in August, uh, we maybe could have prevented much of the spread that we saw in the fall and winter. We could have potentially prevented hundreds of thousands of additional deaths. Uh, but now vaccines are here. Are they still useful? Unfortunately, you know, the virus just isn't going away anytime soon. We all want it to. Uh, but with vaccines, we're still going to see spread continue much at lower levels. Uh, but there is, there, this virus has a lot of tricks up its sleeve still. Uh, if for no other reason, we should be getting these tests available in the event that we see resurgence, which I think we will uh, in the fall. It won't be as big as last year, but we will see resurgent cases. This is a, a seasonal virus and we'll probably see increases this October, November, December, just like we did last year. And, uh, and probably, unfortunately, many of the, the most vulnerable people who were vaccinated, are, their immunity is going to start waning uh, faster than other people. And it's, it's very likely that some people might start losing protection uh, from the vaccines they received. And then when we include variants of concern into this picture, it becomes a much more bleak picture if we start seeing variants like B1351 and P1, these variants that have been in the news a bit, 
they they might end up uh, you know infiltrating uh, the 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 cases that we're seeing in this country. And it's all sort of when these when these all combine, it essentially paints a picture that although we're in a much much better position than we were last year, uh, unfortunately we're not out of the woods yet. How could these tests be used to safely reopen the kind of economic activity we really need? I'm thinking of schools, for instance, I mean, travel to a certain extent, offices, if we want to go down that route as well. I mean, if they're cheap and they're very fast, could they be kind of points of entry to let people know they can go back in these spaces and be safe? Absolutely. That's There's, there's two ways that I think of as using these tests. One is public health outbreak mitigation. That's what I would have liked to see uh, this past year to actually keep the outbreaks from really emerging or suppressing them if they exist. Uh, there's a whole different use, which is entrance screening. And it's exactly as it sounds. It's a way to make the other side of an entrance way, whether it be to a school, an office, a building, uh, safer than it otherwise would be. And in this case, a simple test, if, if people walking into that building use a test at home before work or at the doorway before school, whatever that might be, uh, it can reduce any chances of spread, say 90%. Uh, and that is a major win. It's not perfect, but no, nothing in this pandemic is perfect. But a reduction by 90% uh, would be a, a massive benefit to make everyone feel safer. Uh, it doesn't mean go out and throw away all other public health mitigating strategies, but it's a simple one. 30 seconds in the morning could could really make you and your colleagues and your children uh, feel much better about being out and about at work or at school for the full day. And what kind of funding might be necessary to really make this a national program? Such that again, we anyone could have these tests as they needed to take probably multiple times per week. Yeah, uh, so the, the funding would probably be on the order of 10 to $20 billion, uh, which might sound to the average person like a lot, but we just passed a $1.9 trillion package. So uh, this the, these billions are really minimal when it comes to a tool that could potentially greatly accelerate the reopening of the economy, accelerate the reopening of schools, which is exactly, by the way, what the CDC last week and the White House came out and said they wanted. Of course, they're at the whim of what tests are authorized, which are being held up you know, by FDA regulation at the moment. But there is a, a real yearning for these at the White House and the CDC. Uh, and in fact, the president and the, the recent uh, package has essentially set aside $10 billion to start for an increase of testing for schools. So that gets us a very long way in terms of uh, the funding needed. Now we just need the tools to actually be be available for 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 states to actually purchase with the funds that are now being allocated. And you you have an ongoing study, actually, I believe, with Citigroup and sort of looking at how these tests might help with return to work there. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so with uh, Citibank, uh, as well as a couple of other companies, including LivePerson, a, a software company, mm -hmm. we have developed an, a study to evaluate how well these types of tests can be used uh, at home every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday by individuals going to work at Citibank locations. Uh, so far, it's been su very successful. Uh, we have been finding people who are positive before they would have been found to be positive through symptomatic uh, attestation into an app, for example. Uh, and they're able to uh, stay home as a result of finding out they're positive early on. Because it's a study, we're also confirming all of the tests with PCR to ensure that uh, we're getting valid results. And uh, in general, I think that this is going to uh, create a roadmap. When we ask people in the city, in the study, how they feel about it, you know, the overwhelming thought is, why doesn't everyone have access to these types of tests at home? Why do I have to be enrolled in a clinical study to evaluate them to get access? So it's been, I think it's really at least laying some blueprints uh, for what businesses and large corporations maybe could take on as a means to accelerate the reopening. And just lastly, with our last 30 seconds or so, I've been talking about blueprints. Does this also point the way towards a future where diagnostics could be much more broadly available across the board, you know, where we're not just looking for this virus, but other viruses out there in a quick, easy at home way? Oh, absolutely. Viruses, uh, you know, I think what this pandemic is doing is it's accelerating the at home diagnostics. Uh, the technologies are accelerating. You no, know, someday we'll be able to be checking our blood lipid panels and our cardiac markers. Uh, not just infectious diseases, but absolutely, this will lead to a, 
a, a larger accessibility of at home and, and very frequent rapid to use testing. All right, Dr. Mena, thank you very much for your time. Oh, thanks so much. Our final guest is the director of the University of Minnesota Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, Dr. Michael Osterholm, joining us from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dr. Osterholm, it's great to see you. Thank you, it's good to be with you. You've been very vocal about your predictions that the next few weeks, next several weeks really, uh, we could be headed into could be some of the worst of the pandemic. Why is that and what role do variants in particular play when you think of that prediction? Well, we really have two uh, competing uh, sides of uh, the issue right now. One is we are getting more people vaccinated, which is a very, very good thing. Uh, however, when you look at the actual numbers, the total people vaccinated, we have, for example, now still 18 million individuals 65 years of age and older who are not vaccinated. We see uh, in younger age populations, uh, again, limited numbers of people vaccinated. Uh, and when you look at what's happened in Europe, when you see B117 activity, uh, children play a very important critical role in getting infected and spreading the virus and then spreading it to younger adults uh, into middle age and then older adults. And if you look at say uh, countries, whether they be Malta or Hungary, countries that are uh, similar to us in terms of their vaccination efforts and also having previously had infections uh, at the rate similar to ours, you can see even when their lockdown conditions occur, they still are seeing uh, exponential growth in cases. Even right here in our own hemisphere, Chile, uh, has uh, exceeded us in terms of the number of people vaccinated per population. They too have had uh, a, a tremendous number of cases before this current activity. Uh, and yet with that, they too are now seeing major increases in cases. So even when you take those countries that are like us, uh, there still are real challenges with B117 because of its increased infectivity and because of its ability to cause more severe disease among more people. So our only hope right now is, is that uh, we as a country take this seriously and uh, do whatever we can to limit transmission uh, as these other countries have tried to do. And yet at the same time, I sit here and tell you, we've never been more open as a country since the very first days of the pandemic. So how then do you look at the policies we're, we're actually going after right now? As you mentioned, we're probably more open now than we have been since the start of the pandemic. That's the trend we're seeing around the country in red states and blue states. How do you look at both from the federal level down lower uh, in terms of how we're actually approaching this? Because it really does feel as if people are thinking that this is basically we're near the end. We have the vaccines coming. What else do we have to worry about? Well, you know, again, this is a tale of two cities in the sense that there is reason to be optimistic about the vaccines coming. The problem is we're not going to have that much vaccine to materially impact in a major way transmission in this country till well into late spring and early summer. So what we've got to do is get through the next uh, six to 12 weeks. The second thing is the fact that uh, when you look at the issue of transmission, uh, we at this point don't believe that this is a real problem anymore by all of our opening up. And look no further than just the recommendations with schools. If you look at what happened in Europe last winter uh, in December, January, right into now, what you're seeing is, in fact, that where school openings occurred, young children between the ages of basically uh, kindergarten right up through high school were major sources of transmission in those communities. And often they were a very critical point in shutting down transmission by closing schools. We're doing just the opposite. You just heard CDC last week say you can go from six to three feet. You've heard it a major uh, initiative on the part of the federal government and state governments to get schools open. That was fine before B117 came along because the data from the past year did support you could open up schools, uh, particularly through K through eight, and uh, not see a lot of transmission. Here we are now flying in the face of that, and the European countries have tried to tell us that. So it is frustrating, it's challenging. And as I've said many times, you know, in this country, we're really good at pumping the brakes after we wrap the car around the tree. And what I worry about is these next six to 12 weeks, we're gonna have people who will, may only be weeks away from getting their vaccine who will die from this infection because we have not understood that no, there are more than enough people still vulnerable to this virus to get it. Number two, the transmission dynamics are gonna change and it won't be quite the same way that it was. 
And number three, we don't seem to care in the sense that we're opening up everything uh, at local, state, and even federal levels. So what role can testing play possibly in ameliorating that somewhat at least? Because we've seen that fall as well, even as cases have dropped as vaccines have come in, uh, testing rates have dropped significantly as well. I mean, is there a role for greatly expanded testing to play in terms of trying to reduce the risk of reopening some of these areas like schools, for instance, where you could actually hopefully know whether people are positive before they're actually walking into a building like that? Testing is very important. Our group actually put forward a document last spring uh, about smart testing and how to most effectively use testing, whether it be for the virus or even for the antibody, a correlative protection. And so uh, we somehow seem to have forgotten about testing a bit uh, with the advent of the vaccines. You hear less about it, when in fact it's every bit as important now as it's ever been. Uh, I'm for one con am concerned that with the reduced testing availability, and there surely is that happening, uh, and, and I can tell you, I can attest to the fact that in many locations, people who are doing testing are now doing vaccinating, which is important, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't have testing. The second thing is the public has, in a sense, moved on beyond testing. We know of a number of examples where particularly younger adults who may have some symptoms uh, very strongly supportive of COVID-19 illness, they may even have had exposures where they don't want to get tested. They don't want to be found. They don't, you know, unless they're going to the hospital, they would rather not be known. And so we're missing those. And then finally, as we do more rapid testing, uh, which may have a, a role to play in institutional settings, et cetera, but none of that's reportable. So that if someone is found to be positive on these tests, they're technically supposed to be followed up with a, a, a standardized PCR test uh, sample, but they're not. And so I think that right now we have to be very careful about interpreting a lot of the surveillance data we have around uh, test positivity. Unfortunately, we still will catch these cases and hospitalizations and deaths uh, because they too will still occur. It's just there'll be lagging indicators that sometimes will be weeks after the fact of what's been happening uh, proximal to when people would normally be tested. So I think we'll still learn about cases in our community as at least a, a, a relative tip of the iceberg. But I think testing right now poses real challenges in getting it done when at a time we still really need it. What has been, from a policy perspective, the problem with testing here in the U.S.? Because this has been an issue really from the very start. I mean, I think it was one of the first mistakes were made were problems with the initial tests. And then we still had, you know, backlogs. We had bottlenecks. And, and now, of course, we have fewer people actually wanting to, to do it. Is there something from a policy perspective that can be done to actually get these tests to people who need them and actually have them done in a way that is reportable and also actionable? Because I think that's really important, too. Well, we have to understand making the testing available and readily available is critical. And so that at this point with the new resources that are coming to state and local health departments, we're hopeful that they can find the adequate staffing to again, fully support testing uh, locations, testing activities, and to uh, continue to encourage individuals with this kind of uh, infection status, uh, meaning signs and symptoms suggest to COVID, to get tested. Uh, the second piece of that is, is we have to maintain the testing capacity at all of our labs uh, as we do more and more institutional testing. You're going to find with schools, uh, with businesses, uh, you know, travel. There's a lot of requirements for testing that way, which is not really focused on ill people, but rather focused on environments. That can be important, and you still will pick up infected people, but we need to have testing also available clinically for those who may have the signs and symptoms of COVID-19. And uh, that's that right now is a challenge. The final piece of it is we also have to understand how we're gonna move forward in testing, not just for the virus, but for the quota of protection, the antibody. You're already hearing many discussions take place about uh, immune passports, the idea of how will I know if I'm protected? And we have many, many questions about that kind of testing. That's something that has to be on the front burner right now so that we can begin to better understand what the strengths, limitations, what the uh, possibilities are, who will run it, how will it be run, how will the information be used, who will collect it, Many, many questions about that kind of testing. Great. And just lastly, uh, I mean, when you look forward to when hopefully m many of us are vaccinated, I mean, do you think we will be taking tests 
on a regular basis just to keep an eye out for this virus, I suppose, if it does change, if it varies, if it mutates in the future. Just what we'll see is something that we do in the background of, of, of health, really. Well, first of all, we're going to need to test people who have potentially clinically compatible symptoms uh, with COVID-19 forever. Now, this virus is not going away around the world. Remember, we have billions of people in low-income countries, some in middle-income countries who will never have access to vaccine. And where those cases are occurring in those countries, we'll also see variants spin out. And so we're going to constantly be in a battle with this virus relative to the variant issue. Uh, so we're going to have to know what's circulated in our communities. We're going to need not only is it a is is this a SARS-CoV-2 virus, but also what is the variant status. Uh, the second thing is we're also going to need to continue to understand what is a correlate of protection. I don't anticipate seeing lots and lots of people having antibody testing done uh, until we have a better understanding of just what it means to be protected. And these are going to come from our clinical trials. But once we understand that, we may find that at uh, you know, 6 to 8, 10, 12, 18 months, we will want to find out, are we still protected? Uh, and there may be blanket recommendations for booster doses. Uh, that's going to still be a big challenge for us. And, and so I see testing from an antibody standpoint growing in importance, not uh, less important. Great. Well, Dr. Osterholm, thank you so much for joining us here at Axios today. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. Thank you to our sponsor, Siemens Health and Ears, for making this event possible. For more info or to sign up for our newsletters, including my newsletter, Axios Future, or Sam's newsletter, Axios Vitals, visit axios.com backslash newsletters or look on the Axios app. Thank you all for joining, and we'll see you on axios.com.